Welcome everybody to the Real Estate Investment Club. Today, our guest is Chase Frazier. So Chase, before I hand it over to you, I want to re remind everybody that they can find this particular club on Inside Blue. So if we go to, and also on meetup.intel.com. So if you want to get notifications for future clubs, and uh, it always happens Friday at noon Pacific time, but if you want to get notifications, just go to meetup.intel.com and then look for REIC. You can usually search for that and then click on follow over here. And now that you're here, I also want to show you that we've got a great lineup of people that are coming up. Uh, several people responded to my invitation on what should we do for her to uh, to get ready to be a first time home buyer. And so we're going to have a, an upcoming series on first time home purchases. Several of these people are talking about if this is your living, you know, the house that you'll be living in. Some of the other people are talking about if this is your first investment home. So we have Chris Mason who will be coming up. He's a uh, well-known person on bigger pockets. We have Lawrence Sutter, who is an Air Force pilot and real estate investor. Uh, Faviola, who uh, is going to be talking about first-time home buying. And then if I go over here, we have Letka, who will be speaking to us again about first-time investment home buying, but she runs a real estate investment club in Seattle. It's got quite a turnout there. And so we've got a number of people that are coming on, and, and there are actually a few more that aren't here yet. So we're getting a good lineup, particularly about first-time home and buying and first-time home uh, investment purchases. So stay tuned to that. I am still looking for, for a person that will speak on real estate trusts. Um, and if you, there are any other topics that you'd like to talk about, please uh, either email me directly or, better yet, put it in the Yammer channel. We have a Yammer page for the Real Estate Investment Club. And so I encourage people's participation there. Uh, as always, Intel likes me to remind everyone here that the, the views on this club are not representative of Intel, that uh, the people that are here and the guests that speak, their opinions are their own. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Chase. Cool, all right. Let me uh, share my screen. See if I can get this all figured out. Okay, and are we full screen there? Yes, we are. Okay. All righty. So I've got two different screens going here. Um, and, so if I look back and forth, that's just is what it is. But uh, Chase, let, let me interject one thing. People feel free to uh, put your questions in the, the chat sidebar. I'll be monitoring them and I'll periodically maybe interrupt you or hold most of them to the end. Perfect. Sounds yeah. great. And there, there will definitely be time at the end for, for question and answer. So, um, Daniel, thanks a ton for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. I love the opportunity to talk to people about house hacking and uh, what a cool thing it is. Um, I'm a real estate agent with eXp Realty. I'm licensed in both Oregon and Washington. I'm an expert and well-versed and experienced in all forms of real estate investing from wholesaling, flipping, rehabbing, uh, retail buyers and sellers, buying and selling single family and multifamily properties, commercial properties, et cetera. But what I'm what I've particularly fallen in love with uh, is the house hacking concept, and what it, and that's why I'm here today is to explain that to you so you can uh, better understand that. But please understand if you want to do any real estate investing or purchase <clears throat> or sell your single family home, whether it's your first time or your tenth time, uh, I'd love to help you out with that down the road. Quick disclaimer: I'm not a lawyer, CPA, financial advisor, mortgage broker any of that. Uh, I'm a real estate agent, so if you need help in any of those areas, seek advice there. Um, I am with eXp Realty, as we, as we mentioned. So the goal of the presentation and what we're going to cover today is I'm going to give you context and a new perspective on some co uh, common financial concepts and help you understand the problem that house hacking helps to solve. Um, I have a lot of experience in different forms of real estate investing, both pers personally and professionally. 
And I've particularly fallen in love with house hacking and how powerful it actually is. And I'm here today to explain how it works, why it's one of the most powerful wealth building tools available. And we'll also go into how to, how to analyze deals. Um, you'll, you'll understand how to get started and we'll also create a blueprint for house hacking and buying real estate and the possibility of uh, achieving financial independence in 10 years with house hacking. So with that, let's put a couple things into context. And the first thing we'll talk about is retirement so that we can understand the problem uh, so we can find a better answer. Now, if we look at retirement and we Google retire, it's gonna come up with leave one's job and cease to work typically upon reaching the normal age for leaving employment. Now, I added the emphasis there because those three phrases that are underlined, I don't particularly care for. Cease to work, what if I want to continue to work in some, uh, in some form in the future, even after I retire? So um, typically, what typically to me is just fairly vague and so is normal age for leaving employment. So that's just why I, I underlined those. A simple definition is living off a stream of passive income that meets or exceeds your expenses. All right, so uh, I just talked about income. I'm sure everybody's well-versed on the different types of income, but let's cover those uh, real quick. So income is just money we make. Um, active income is money we actively work for or we trade our time for, like our day job. And then passive income is money we don't have to actively work for. So retirement in society's, in society's view would be something like this. So we would go to school. It's always a good idea to go to school and, and to learn, get good grades, and then go to a good college. And here's where the first, you could call it potential flaw in society's view would be, is go to school or go to college. Because a lot of people are gonna have to take out student loans, and that's a big hole in your money bucket. And I'll get into money in just a moment, so that statement will, uh, will make a little more sense. And then, so, uh, Go to college and then get a good job with good benefits like a 401k and then retire in 62 and a half year or when, retire when we're 62 and a half or 40 years typically there's that typically we're again so so what is a job with good benefits um a job with good benefits would be like one with a 401k that matches the first five percent and then what we would be able to do is build up a large enough nest egg that we could live off of uh live off of the rest of it after we retire and we would follow what is common, commonly known as the 4% rule. And then if you look into that, what that uh, is, can be described as is we can withdraw 4% of our portfolio value each year in retirement without incurring a substantial risk of running out of money. Now, let's pretend something. Let's pretend that you are used to living off of just $50,000 now. In 40 years at 3% inflation, that would mean that you would be used to living off $163,000 per year. Now, uh, to withdraw $163,000 a year and abide by the 4% rule, the nest egg you would need would be more than $4 million. And if you're planning on Social Security to maybe help supplement that, I wouldn't necessarily go that route. So here's some more scary thoughts. This is some info that I pulled off of a CNBC article. Um, what will your savings rate have to be to build a nest egg of over $4 million if you want to retire at 65 while maintaining a comfortable standard of living in retirement. So the answer to that, if you start at age 25, you need to save 10 to 17% of your current income. If you're starting a little later, like at age 35, you would need to save 15 to 20% of your current income. That article goes on to say, based on our estimation, families age 25 to 64 are currently only saving a median amount of six to eight percent of their income towards retirement. So that's uh, that's pretty scary if you ask me. So most American workers aren't saving at levels that will allow them to retire fully at age 65 at their current standard of living. That was from Stanford Center of Longevity. On top of that, seven and eight Americans won't maintain a comfortable living in retirement. So Think about that real quick. Think about everybody on this call. Only one in eight are going to reach that $4 million a year nest egg. And that would be comfortable standard of living in retirement if you're used to living on $50,000 a year now. Now think about eight people that you know, only one in eight of them are going to retire and maintain a comfortable standard of living. You know, you have to ask the question, is that you? Are you that one in eight? St statistically speaking, probably not. And if, if you're not, if that's not you, you need to start taking action now.
All right, so now let's jump into a, a different uh, concept called financial independence. We'll go over it real quickly. I like financial independence more than retirement because if you define it, it's having enough passive income to cover your living expenses without having to work unless you want to so you can pursue your life's passion. Again, it's when our passive income meets or exceeds our regular expenses. So lots of similarities. For the most part, it's when our passive income is greater than or equal to our expenses. And then the difference is there's no age associated with financial independence. So what do we do when we retire or achieve financial independence? Hopefully we pursue our life's passion. So ask yourself this question. When do you want to retire or achieve financial independence? And how are you going to get there or how are you going to achieve it? Okay, so just recapping real quick, the financial independence formula is when we have passive income greater than or equal to our expenses, then we've achieved financial independence. So how are we going to get there? By turning our active income into passive income and controlling our expenses and our spending habits. All right, so one last thing to do real quick is we'll, I'm going to put money into a, a context that uh, maybe you haven't heard before. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's what I've it's the best um, best way I've ever heard it described. So money is like water and we're all holding a bucket. And there are two variables that control how full our bucket is. The money that comes in to our bucket, it's kind of like a faucet, and then money that goes out or our spending habits. And these are the holes in our bucket and they can be big or small. So um, your monthly Netflix bill would be a small hole. Student loans would be a big hole. Housing expenses would be a big hole. All right, and my assumption is that you want your bucket filling up. At worst, you want it to stay at the same level. We don't want our money bucket running out. So how do we personally control how full our bucket is? One is how much water comes into our bucket and how fast or how much money are we making? And then the amount of money we make is either, you know, in active income or in passive income. And then how much water flows out of our bucket and how fast? Uh, the amount of money we live on and our spending habits. So the first financial independence questions we need to ask ourselves are which side of the financial independence equation can I have the greatest influence on right away? And do I know exactly how much money comes out of my bucket every month? Now that last question has to do with budgeting. I'm a super budgeting nerd, I love it. Um, I use mint.com, it's a great free resource that you can uh, use for budgeting. If you haven't been on it before, I would strongly recommend checking it out. And the second financial independence question we need to ask is how do I turn my active income into passive income? So listen, there are a lot, many, 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 many different ways to turn active income into passive income and many different forms of real estate investing. And I've got experience in a lot of them. You know, I've wholesaled, I've flipped properties, I've helped retail buyers and sellers, I've helped house hackers purchase properties, uh, investors buy single family, multifamily properties, even commercial properties. But the one that I want to share with you today and that I'm very passionate about and that I believe in and actively practice uh, is house hacking. Because for folks like you, it makes a lot, of, uh, a lot of sense. And let me explain why. So here's how it works and why it's the ultimate tool. Here's the basics. Um, it's a real estate investing strategy for people who want to either reduce their housing costs and or get into buy and hold real estate investing with a relatively low financial barrier to entry. Now, why is it a low financial barrier to entry? Because if you're going to buy a property uh, and house hack, you're going to move into it so you can get a residential loan. And with the residential loan, you'll actually have a smaller down payment. For a property you're going to move into, you can use loan products like an FHA loan where you only have to put 3.5% down uh, to move into a property. If you are someone who has access to a VA loan, a Veterans Affairs loan, then you can get 0% down. So um, that's a lot better than purchasing a property where you have to put 20% down if it's going to be a non-owner occupied property. So how house hacking works is you would purchase a residential property of one to four units. So that could be a single family home, a home with an ADU, or a two, three, or four unit property like duplex, triplex. You're going to move in and live in one room or unit and rent out the rest. 
by renting out the rest and applying those funds toward, towards your mortgage payment, that's how you reduce the amount of money that comes out of your pocket for your housing expenses. So the financing is really the biggest benefit of house hacking. So a residential mortgage, like we were talking about, is a lower down payment, and there's also lower interest rates. Um, roughly speaking, when you purchase a property and you're going to move into it, you hear that interest rates are extremely low right now. They're hovering around 3%. That's unbelievably low. If you're going to purchase a property as an investment and not live in it, you're going to typically have a higher interest rate of about 1%. And we'll get into that here in just a second. So cost of a traditional investment property that you're not going to move in. So this is a, a way to look at it uh, just a little differently. So the down payment percentage is much higher. It's going to be in the 20 to 25% down range. And um, the interest rates, like we just talked about, are going to be about one percentage point higher than residential or an owner-occupied loan. And every $100,000 you borrow uh, with a 1% higher inter uh, interest percentage point equals about $60 per month. So let's dig into that. So let's pretend <clears throat> you're going to purchase a four unit in our market and the purchase price is $800,000. Now, if you're gonna use an investment loan, you have to put 25% down and that equals $200,000. Now, not a lot of people have $200,000 available just for a down payment. That wouldn't even count money you would need for closing costs or uh, repairs and reserves, etc. cetera. So um, that's quite a, big chunk of money. Now, if you're going to house hack it and move into one of the rooms or units, you could use an FHA loan and put three and a half percent down, which is only, in quotes, $28,000. So that's a whole lot less money to come up with to buy that same $800,000 four unit property. So your money bucket doesn't have to be as full, but you can still buy that same $800,000 asset. So now in this scenario, we're going to talk about the, um, the percentage on the interest rate. So now let's pretend we've made our down payment and the loan balance is $800,000. So with a residential mortgage, the interest rate is lower by about 1%. So in our market today, that would be around 3% if you were going to limit it. If it was just an investment property, it would be closer to 4%. Now remember that every $100,000 we borrow equals about a $60 a month difference in uh, payment for our mortgage. So a residential loan would save you $5,760 per year or $480 per month, $120 per week. And the value, if you invested that money in 30 years and you were able to get a 10% return is $1.1 million just by living in the property. Uh, quick note, you only have to live in the property for a year when you house hack it. Then you can move out and you can keep that loan in place. You don't have to refinance it. So just by doing that, you could uh, generate over $1.1 million um, return. So now let's talk about the lower cost of entry in the down payment. So you only have to save a small amount relative to an ordinary investment property purchase, and you still get to enjoy the benefits of appreciation. A property is going to appreciate at the same amount regardless of the down payment. Yes, the amount of equity will be lower, but um, that $800,000 property is going to appreciate at the same rate whether you put 20% down or 3.5% down. One of the other strengths of house hacking is that it can really lower your expenses and it lowers your costs of living. And if you don't have to pay as much to live where you live, then it helps you fill up your income bucket faster, which helps you save money for future investments to help fill up the bucket even faster, which helps you buy more investments, which helps you fill up, which helps you buy more investments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a positive cycle in that regard. And then also it's going to increase income. After you move out, if you block correctly, it should produce monthly cash flow. Again, that helps you fill up the bucket faster and it helps expedite the process of purchasing more assets that produce more passive income. And then your tenants are gonna be paying down your mortgage, thus building your equity. Um, rents don't tend to go down during uh, difficult economic times. So while uh, the value of a property might drop, uh, rents tend to say, stay the same, so your tenants are going to be paying that um, mortgage for you, and people are always going to need a place to live. If you're going to go sell that property, um, 
you have to pay taxes on investment properties that you sell, uh, unless you're doing a 1031 exchange. And I'm sure Daniel and everyone's chatted about that before. But there's something called, uh, if you live in a property two years out of five, you get an exemption on the capital gains tax for the unit that you live in. So you can save a lot of money in taxes as well if you were gonna go ahead and sell that property. Now, I'm a numbers nerd and I love to run numbers and I took the old um, rent versus buy argument and I added house hacking to it and I created a scenario and I'm just gonna run through it here with you. These numbers are crazy powerful. And um, so here's here's how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna, the basic assumptions is we're gonna look at a 10 year time frame from today to 10 years out in the future. We're going to imagine that you will eventually want to live in your own single family home. You're not going to want to live in a multifamily for 10 years. We will assume that rent increases at 5% per year. Remember in uh, Oregon, we have a cap on how much we can increase rents per year and that cap is roughly around 10%. It floats a little bit. Um, so we will be conservative and say we can increase at 5% per year. We're gonna say our real estate's gonna appreciate at 4.2% a year when the historical average is closer to seven or 8%. We're gonna say that the mortgage payments stay the same and the 1% rule output is gonna be 0.66. So the 1% rule, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, is just a quick calculation to determine a baseline of the quality of a deal. The equation is pretty simple. It's gross rents for all units divided by the purchase price. So if you bought a duplex at $450,000, and you had $3,000 in gross rents or $1,500 from each side, then you would get an output of 0.66. And just for those who are curious, the average output in the Portland metropolitan area is 0.6. In high cost of living areas, areas Portland, Seattle, basically any West Coast cities, you're gonna get a lower output. Um, in the Midwest, where you're able to invest for cash flow, you will actually see that 1% uh, uh, return on that. Okay, so now let's jump into this, uh, renting. So here's the assumptions. Your monthly rent's gonna be $1,500 uh, in year one. After 10 years, it will have uh, appreciated or gone up to 2325. So your yearly housing cash flow, how much you paid for uh, rent in a year would be $18,000 in year one. Year 10, it would be almost $28,000. Then if you look in the graph, that aggregates to $226,402 over 10 years. There's no loan balance because you don't own any property, nor no property value, no equity. Difference in housing and equity, um, we'll get into that in just a second. And there's no cash flow at the year, end of year 10 because you don't own any rental, uh, in rental property. So this is the flow of money out of your pocket if you decided to rent for 10 years. Now, buying a single family home is a much better decision than renting, and here's why. So here's our assumptions. The purchase price is $400,000 three and a half percent down. Here are your monthly mortgage payments rounded up to your yearly payments. So over 10 years, you will pay $257,000 out of pocket on your mortgage payment. Your loan balance will go down to about $300,000, but the property appreciates to just over $600,000, which then means you have equity of $302,000. So the difference in housing and equity is just an aggregation of the housing cash flow and equity. The difference there is $44,560. So you're actually uh, out of the red if you buy a home after 10 years. Annual cash flow per year in year 10 is still $0 because you don't have any property that you're renting out. Okay, now let's pretend that you're gonna house hack. In this scenario, you're gonna buy a duplex. You're gonna live in it for two years, then you're gonna move out into your, and buy a single family home. Here are all the assumptions. The purchase price of the duplex $50,000. The single family home is $433,000 because uh, in this assumption or in this scenario, um, prices have appreciated. Down payment 3.5% on each. There's the mortgage payments for each. Uh, rents starting at $1,500 aside, increasing 5% per year. So now your annual housing cash flow uh, or your housing cash flow after 10 years is you're only out of pocket $92,000, just about $93,000, which is down over $100,000 if you were gonna just buy a home. The loan balance on the two properties is about 690,000. The property values, now you own nearly $1.3 million in, in property. Equity is almost $600,000 and the difference between those is five, $501,600. So you've made half a million dollars by house hacking one time. And at the end of 10 years, 
you are uh, you have twenty seven thousand dollars a year of passive income. All right. So if you're going to house hack twice, so buy a duplex, live in it for two years, buy another duplex, live in that one for two years while keeping the current duplex and then buy your single family home. Uh, while keeping those other duplexes, here's how that all plays out. So here's all the assumptions with those numbers run out. I don't need to get into those. I'm more interested in this stuff on the right. So after 10 years, you're actually going to be paid to live where you live, nearly $43,000. So you've made money from collecting rent um, over the mortgage payments. Loan balances, $1.1 million, but property value is uh, almost $1.9 million. Your equity is in the neighborhood of $737,000. And the difference between those those two, the housing cash flow number and the equity number now add up. And the difference is $780,000. After 10 years, you're going to have $52,000 in cash flow. So the question becomes then, would you rather rent or house hack? So I dug into these numbers even more uh, and ran out a couple scenarios like what if I were to house hack three or four times and I just put these in this table. Um, if you look closely uh, in our market, if you decide to house hack once or twice somewhere in there, that's where it's actually going to happen to where you would live for free. And then the loan balances property values. If you decided to house hack four times and then buy your single family home, you would have um, property values in the neighborhood of $3.3 .3 million. And then the equity would be $1.1 $1 million if you, if you own those four house hacks in a single family home. Here's the differences in the um, housing and equity. Now, pretend this. Pretend that you and I are sitting together after our 10 year or at our 10 year college reunion. And the topic of real estate came up and you asked me what I'd been doing. And I said, you know, I hadn't really decided I just ended up renting uh, a place for the last 10 years. I don't own any property. You can see that I will have paid out $226,402 uh, of money just to live where I want. And you, um, you're like, oh, okay. And you were actually involved in real estate and you purchased two, two duplexes that you house hacked and then you purchased a single family home that you lived in. So here's the two numbers. And just by you deciding that you're going to house hack twice and then buy a single family home, that one decision was a million dollar decision, over a million dollars. Then if we run these out, if you house hacked four times after 10 years, you'd have nearly six figures of passive income. Okay. So analyzing deals, what's good enough? Uh, what's a, what makes a good enough deal in our market or what's an acceptable deal in our market? So ideally, you want to lower your cost of housing and how you figure out cost of housing is simply the mortgage cost less the rent connected equals the cost of housing. This doesn't always happen. Uh, imagine someone who used to live with their parents and then goes and buys a multifamily property that they're going to house hack. They go from zero dollars in housing expenses to maybe having to cover six hundred dollars of the uh, mortgage payment. So it doesn't always apply, but if you're, if you're living somewhere um, like in a Renko station and you're paying whatever it is for that two bedroom apartment, and then you go to house hack, in that scenario, your, uh, your housing costs need to come down. And I've got some examples of what that might look like coming up here in a moment. So you wanna lower your housing costs, and then the property must be cash flow neutral when you move out at the current rents. And what that means is that current rents have to be greater than or equal to the mortgage payment. That's a hard line in the sand. You don't want to buy a property that's not going to float going down, um, down the road. So what makes a better deal? Uh, the condition of property. Some people are looking for a turnkey property that they can just move into and it's ready to go and they can rent it out right away. Uh, other people want to find a property where they can add a little value to it. And then what are the rents or what are the current rents versus the market rents, especially here in Portland? Um, as I talked about earlier, you can only raise rents about 10% a year. And uh, if you buy a property that one or more of the units is rented out below market rent, imagine they're at 50% of the market rent. It's going to take you a really long time to get those back up to market rent, which makes it um, a little difficult for that deal to pencil out. And then location. So, Proximity to jobs, schools, transportation, a desirable area. 
um, crime rates, development, etc. Now, my wife and I purchased uh, a duplex back in November, and uh, I'd love to go over what our preferences were with you, but I don't have the time to do this. But if you want to go over it, I'd be more than happy to do so. You can send me an email, and we can set up a time to chat. Uh, I'll give you my email at the end of the um, of the presentation. Okay. So, how do you actually get started in doing this? Um, First, you have to decide it's possible. Some people just aren't necessarily, um, they just don't think it's possible or they're not aware of the possibilities. And then you have to decide why you wanna do it and that the payoff is worth the pain. Are you willing to go through with the growing pain so that you can live a life that not many other people can live? And then you decide that it's time to take action. I'm sure many of you have heard the old Chinese proverb of when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, the second best time to plant a tree is now. So go ahead and get started working on, on this now. Now, what's the reality of what you need to do uh, to get started? First, you find a lender. And there's a lot of loan programs out there for first time buyers of single family homes where you can get 101% of the purchase price. This is only for single family homes. It's not for multifamily properties, but there's, uh, you can still house hack single family homes by living in one room and then renting out the rest. Um, also, uh, you can find a non-occupant co-borrower to help you qualify for more. Um, you know, you can you could call them investors where maybe it's, I'm helping a client out right now where he has an uncle who is willing, who went in on the loan with him and he's now able, he's under contract on a fourplex in Portland. So that non-occupant co-borrower can help you borrow a little more money to afford a little more. Uh, and then you need to find a realtor to show you homes. Um, now, look. Any, any Tom, Dick, or Harry can get a real estate license and help you through a transaction. But if they're not analyzing that transaction from the perspective of saving you money and building you wealth, then you need to find another agent. To me, real estate isn't a hobby, it's, it's a passion, and I make millionaires. The average agent doesn't have a clue what they're doing when it comes to the, in the realm of value and wealth building. So it's a subspecialty that 98% of them will never even scratch uh, the surface on. So you need to find a good agent. So then once, uh, once that happens, we start making offers for you, and then your offer gets accepted and you close the deal. That's how you, how you get started on it. The recommendation of how to get started on it is you need to learn and learn to track your money and your credit score. And you can request your credit score from the three different credit reporting bureaus. You need to have a good understanding of uh, the inflow and outflow of your money. And then figure out what your long-term investment strategy is and how house hacking will aid you in achieving it. So this is kind of like your business plan. After that, uh, contact professionals to help you refine your strategy and get started. So you're gonna find uh, a realtor and a lender, and you actually wanna have your realtor help you find the lender because you wanna find a team that's worked together before. Um, the lending aspect of it is incredibly important, especially when it comes to deciding what loan type you're going to use first. And you need to find a lender that can help guide you through that so that after your first purchase, you're not painting yourself into a corner. Um, I've got a great lender that I work with. If you contact me, I'd be more than happy to get you in touch with them. And then you need to understand your market. And that's simply just by running numbers, by if you ran numbers on 20 multifamily properties using the 1% rule, that would be a good way to understand the baseline of what a good deal is and isn't in our market. And that'll take you a couple hours. And then once new properties come in the market and you do that quick back in the nap napkin calculation, you'll understand if it's worth pursuing. Okay, so a, a blueprint of how to retire in 10 years, um, you need to build your foundation uh, the deeper you build your foundation, the higher you can go. So that basically you need to get your mindset right. Believe that you can do it and then just start taking action. So financial education, attending meetups like this is phenomenal. And Daniel has presented on his syndications at other meetups that I've been to. And I've always been very impressed on how well he uh, describes things and helps people out and usher them through the process. Um, so go to those, read books. Um, you want to do your business planning and set yourself up for success so that you have that roadmap of knowing where you want to go. And that's going to be for you and for your investors. You need to understand your market just by running lots and lots of numbers and then build your team. So once you start building your team, it's the action part. So set, get set up with that uh, real estate agent to get them to help you get set up with a lender and get pre-approved. We start searching for properties for you. You make that purchase. You learn from the experience and then you rinse and repeat. 
could you get started today? Are there any deals like this in the market? Yes, there absolutely are. So here's one in Beaverton. It's about 17 minutes away from campus. Purchase price is $430,000. Each unit is a three bedroom, one, in, one bathroom at 865 square feet. Your mortgage payment would be $2,400 and you would collect about $1,600 in the other unit that you're not living in. So your share of the mortgage payment would be $800. Here's another one in Beaverton that's pretty close to the other one, and it's about 18 minutes from campus. Uh, one unit is two bedrooms, one bathroom. The other one is three bedrooms, one bathroom. Both units are 1,281 square feet. Your mortgage payment would be $3,200. You would collect $1,700 of rent from the other unit, and then your share would be $1,500. As you can see, this one compared to the other one might not be as good a deal. Here is a four unit on Northwest Rock Creek Boulevard. Uh, it's 10 minutes from campus, um, $825,000. Three of the units are two bedrooms, one and a half bathrooms, 900 square feet. And then one of the units is three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 1,100 square feet. Your mortgage payment would be $4,600. If you lived in one of the two bedroom units, you would collect $4,000 a month in rent. Therefore, you would be out of pocket $600 a month to live in a four unit building worth close to a million dollars. Here's another one in Cornelius. It's a little further away, it's 21 minutes away, but the purchase price is a lot lower at about $690,000. All of the units are two bedrooms, one bathroom, uh, 821 square feet. Your mortgage payment would be $3,800, but you would collect $3,600 a month in rent. So you would only be out of pocket uh, $200. So that would be one of the, you know, a lot of times when we're looking to buy assets or investment in real estate, we're going to make sacrifices of where do we want to live, how much do we want to pay, etc. So this is a perfect example of this fourplex in Cornelius versus the fourplex in Rock Creek. Um, how close do you want to live to work? How much do you want to pay? So that's just something to keep in mind as we go. So, um, so I'm pretty well versed and an expert in all forms of real estate investing, and I would say that I can fulfill, fulfill your needs in that regard. But my particular passion is house hacking. And because for folks like you, it does make a lot of sense. So if you're looking for more resources, one place you can go is to mrhousehack.com. That's my website. And there you can find a lot of info on house hacking. Uh, I know there are a lot of people on this call who are not in Oregon. Uh, one thing that we do is we also, um, because not all real estate agents are created equal, we help house hackers like yourself connect with agents in their own area. So um, if you're looking for somebody who knows how to help uh, a house hacker or really just an investment friendly realtor in your area, you can actually go to mrhousehack.com and fill out a form and I'll help you find that realtor. Now what you can also do is you can just send me an email at chase at mrhousehack and I can help you find a realtor in your area or really anybody on this call if you want a free 15 minute consultation about anything um, real estate at all, whether it's investing, single family homes, et cetera. I'd love to set up a 15 minute call with you. If you want to do it on syndications, talk to Daniel. He's your man on that. Uh, I'm also available on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to look at some other websites, uh, mint.com is phenomenal and personalcapital.com is another really good one. A couple podcasts I like to listen to are the Bigger Pockets Money podcast and the Choose FI podcast. And with that, I am more than happy to uh, answer any questions you guys might have. Hey, Chase, I think that's how you say your name, right? I missed that intro. Uh, it, it's kind of ironic, right? Um, I have a 20 year old son. He's going to Arizona State. We're down here in Arizona. He just went and got his, uh, passed his real estate exam, got his real estate license, just joined EXP. And nice. I've been push. I've been pushing for him to uh, not necessarily to move out, but to find a, a place near school that he could uh, buy, or I could help him to buy, and then he can start house hacking, so he can start building some equity and get into it. So I may reach out to you offline for some support. Yeah, I'd be happy to help. You know, I gave uh, this presentation at University of Portland to their uh, um, real estate investing club. And what a lot of those students were interested in is like single family house hacks because a lot of them live in a single family home right next to campus and they rent right. out a room. Right. So 
Um, and what I what I help them with is, you know, investors, right? So a college student likely won't be able to apply for a loan and get it. But what they can do is they can ask their parents or whomever they might be willing to ask to co-sign on the loan for them. And then they can get in that house and it teaches them a lot, you know, so they would, uh, if they want to get into real estate investing, they can learn a lot of responsibility of what it's like to manage people, uh, especially for any managers on the call, you know what that's like and can be a little challenging sometimes. Run a successful business, how to communicate, um, and then see if real estate investing is actually for them. And what I've done um, is I created a business plan that is fillable by people, especially imagine this is for college students, that they can take it, they can put all their information in it, and then they can present that to their investors to, um, to let them know that they're serious and they've thought this out a lot. I'd love to chat about this with you, with him, whomever, um, at length. That'd be great. Do you typically put those in an LLC before you start the house hack? Process. You cannot do that. If you're going to own or occupy, it has to be in your own name. But with enough insurance and the right insurance, you can cover yourself on a lot of it. Because okay. if you uh, if you put it into an LLC, an LLC won't lend to an owner occupant. And um, so yeah, it's got it's got to be in your own name. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions I can answer for anyone? Hey, yeah, I had a quick question. You mentioned getting uh, someone to co-sign on the loan if you're not in the position to receive a loan yourself. Do you have any uh, tips on convincing the co-signer that you're not crazy? Um, great question. Send me an email, and I'll send you the business plan I was just talking about. Awesome. And then, Thanks and so you much. Can just, you can fill it in. Uh, it, it goes through a lot of different scenarios of why you're doing it, where you're going to go from here, the benefits of it. Uh, it goes over a lot of the stuff I talked about in the presentation, and it just sets you up in a position to, when you do present it, that whomever is going to be the co-signer is like, they've thought a lot about this and how it works and the financial benefits of it. So it's a, it's a document that explains uh, succinctly what I, what I talked about here. So I'd be more than happy to send that to you or anybody else who wants it or anybody else who um, who could use it. I would just ask that you don't post it on social media everywhere for people to, to grab. That would be my only uh, favor. Yeah, of course not. Chase, thanks for the offer. Yeah, absolutely. Chase, Chase, what is that email address or is it on just Mr. House Hack? Can we get it to you through there? Uh, it's Chase, C-H-A-C-E, at MrHouseHack.com. Thank you. Uh, do you have a uh, guideline or some suggestions on how to look for these properties, like where to look for these properties? You gave the examples, um, three or four examples near the Intel campus. Something yeah, like so when I, when I pulled all those examples, I just got on the RMLS and looked at two to four unit properties uh, with the right type of tenancy. So it would just be a lot of people I know um, I have a lot of clients that I just have set up on searches that um, I'm happy to do so. And um, other people, strangely enough, Zillow.com, Realtor.com, Redfin don't have a really good search function for multifamily properties. Um, so it's with the RMLS and the fact that I'm an agent, I have a little more robust search capabilities and I can filter out different things. Uh, so that's a lot of times the easiest way. One thing I didn't mention is the types of tenancies in these properties is crucial. So in order to buy a property that you're going to house hack, the, one of the units has to either be vacant, owner occupied, or on a month to month lease. Because um, in order for you to move into it, it has to be one of those three tenancy types. If, uh, imagine this scenario, you just rented out your apartment that you're now living in, and there's 10 months left on your lease, and a new owner comes and buys it they cannot kick you out because you have a legally binding contract that says you get to stay in it for an additional 10 months. So we just need to make sure we find the right occupancy type in the area that you want to buy and for you to buy it. And Zillow, Redfin, Trulia, 
realtor.com don't allow you to search by occupancy types in those areas. So if you want to start a search on those, uh, send me an email. I'd be happy to chat with you and we can get something refined for you so you can start your search. And you said you use the uh, MLS website? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so I had a quick question about school districts. Do you look at school districts as well when doing multifamily investing? Yeah, so everybody's going to have different different criteria of uh, where should I buy. We, um, my wife and I didn't look at school districts. We bought here um, just because we don't plan on having kids. Uh, but properties in, you know, a good school district is going to mean that property values are going to be a little higher than uh, poor school districts. So if for you, if you want it, if you or anyone you knew or someone was going to buy a property and you want to be in a, in a specific school district, then yes, I could absolutely set up a search for you to get you into that specific school district. Now, um, because you're really, you might be really narrowing the, the search so much that you don't get a whole lot of results and the, um, the deals might not be as good. You might not make as much cash flow as you might if you were in a different school district. But um, yeah, typically the better a school district, the higher the rents are going to be, but you're going to pay a premium for the property in purchase price. But imagine you own um, you know, a duplex where each side is three bedrooms, one bathroom in a really good school district. You're likely going to get a family that moves in there and because they want their kids to stay in that school district, they're going to kind of set deep roots and they'll live in there for three, four, five years. So you won't have a lot of vacancy. So maybe paying a little extra or a premium for that property in a good school district is worth it to you. Um, if you if you're in the Portland area, and you want to set up a search for like properties, whether they're single family home or multifamily home in a specific school district. I'd be happy to help you out with that. Sounds good. Thanks. Hi, Chase. Uh, I had a quick question. Um, I'm about to graduate college and... Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And I'll be joining the Air Force, so I'll be going to a certain base. Um, what do you see um, with complications of maybe house hacking, you know, when I get to my first base and then if I was to move to a different state, um, but keeping that property and trying to keep doing house hacking, do you see any uh, difficulties with that? You have a phenomenal opportunity is what you've got. So you're going to have access to a VA loan, which is 0% down, and they also cover a lot of your closing costs. So you might not have to pay any money to get into one of these two, three, or four unit properties. The property will have to be a good enough deal to, to make sure that it can support itself when you don't move in. Um, there are requirements of when you purchase a property, uh, like what you have to do. Like in the bank size, you have to move in within 60 days, and you also have to live in the property for a year. But... If you are in the military um, and you get relocated, then that uh, that waives that rule because they recognize that, well, you're not going to disobey orders, so you would go ahead and move. Now, mm -hmm. one of the challenges with FHA loans and VA loans is you can only have one of those loans to your name at any one point in time. Here's what that means. If you're uh, stationed somewhere and you use your VA loan and you buy a duplex and then you're you change stations a year later, you can't use a VA loan again uh, if it's on another property. How you could mm -hmm. use it again is that you could refinance out of that original VA loan to use again. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes so, sense. But what you could do for that next property is you could then use your FHA loan where it's three and a half percent down. Or there's a, a conventional loan product called uh, Home Possible where it's a 5% down loan product. I really like that conventional um, uh, home possible loan. There is an income ceiling on it, so not everybody's going to qualify, but it's a conventional product. Um, and after you reach a certain amount of equity, then PMI drops away, and you would be able to then use uh, your FHA again. So hypothetically, a good strategy for you would be at your first station, you would buy, uh, whether it's one, two, three, or four units with your VA loan. Then when you go to your next location, you would use the conventional home possible loan if you qualified for it, and that would be 5% down. And then on your third property, you would then use your FHA loan. 
And then when you get restationed again, hopefully you would have enough equity in that first property where you would refinance out of it into like a conventional loan again, thus making your VA loan available for you. Once again, you could buy your fourth property with your VA loan. You see how you could leapfrog it that way? Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. So yeah, it's it's that sort of strategy and and thinking that a lot of people don't understand and realize. Like imagine uh Imagine you bought this first one with your VA loan and you're like, okay, I want to go buy my next one in my new station. And then you get told, well, you can't use your VA loan again. You have to refinance. You're like, oh, I didn't know that. And then boom, you're just done, stuck in the water. But it's like if you set it up and you're aware of how you can progress moving forward with these different strategies, you can absolutely streamline the process. And that's where a phenomenal lender comes in. I learned that from my lender here in Portland. Um, she and I have been through a lot. We're battle tested together. Pardon the pun, not not intended. But um, <laughs> that's uh, it's it's crucial to set yourself up for success and do some of that planning, especially with the lender ahead of time, so that you can create that strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Chase, question on the occupancy types. So if I understand you correctly, you can have, say, a, a four-unit property and then either live there or leave one of the units vacant or rent it out months to months. So you don't have to live there necessarily. Oh, I'm sorry. I must have misspoke. Um, in order to house hack, to get the benefits of it, you have to live in the property. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then in order for that property to qualify or to be, we'll call it house hackable, you have to be able to move into it within 60 days of closing. The easiest way to do that is to have one of the properties vacant or one of the units vacant, excuse me. The others can be oh, I see. with month to month or like leased, uh, fixed term leases. Um, so that's the easiest way. The second easiest way would be one of the units is owner occupied because then they would just get out. They wouldn't be concerned about uh, moving out. It gets more challenging when you get a month-to-month -month tenant in. Uh, what, where are you located, Dennis? Um, Arizona. Okay, so I'm not familiar with Arizona's landlord-tenant laws. Um, our laws here in Oregon are very tenant-friendly. That's just, it is what it is. It's the environment we play in. But um, so when we're writing offers for clients who are looking to buy a property to house hack here, and that uh, property is tenanted with month-to-month -month tenants, we have to jump through a bunch of hoops and create an offer strategy that makes it desirable for the seller to accept our offer. So here's what I mean. So you must move into a property within 60 days of closing, but in Oregon, for a, we call it a no cause eviction, um, you have to give them 90 days notice, you have to give the tenants 90 days notice of a no cause eviction. So you, if you're thinking about it, you might see the clash already. It's like, okay, I have to give a 90 day notice, but I have to move in within 60 days of closing. So there's a 30 day window that we have to do some massaging there. So basically what we do is we tell the, um, we, we go under contract, we order the inspections and appraisal right away. Once we've passed inspections and appraisals, there's not much else that will make a contract um, or a, a sale fail. So we just, at that point in time, we ask the owner to serve the 90 day no cause notice to the tenant in the unit we want to occupy. Once that's served, we release a part of our earnest money to go hard to the seller. We won't ever get it back if the sale fails. That's scary, but it shows the owner that we're serious. Imagine you own a four unit and someone comes in and they're like, I want to buy this and owner occupy it. You have to serve notice to this tenant that I'm moving in. Uh, you, serve, you serve notice to that tenant uh, that they have 90 days to get out and then I bail on the sale, you're now going to have a vacant unit that you're high and dry on. So in order for us to entice the sellers to sell to us, we have the seller present that 90 day no cause notice, we release a portion of our earnest money as non-refundable to them, typically it's in the amount of the uh, relocation fee and a couple months rent. And then after they've served that notice and we've released the um, earnest money or part of it to them, we will close 30 days after that. Uh, and then it gives us the 60 day window at the end of uh, after we close to move in. That's a, that's a lot of information to try and suck up quickly. Um, but just wanted to let you know that's how we go about it in Oregon. You might want to talk to 
uh, an agent in your area who who's more familiar with the, the landlord-tenant laws and what you can and can't do. Got it. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Absolutely. So one quick question on finding tenants. Uh, okay. Is the like property manager better or just how do you find them like without having a property manager? That, that's a phenomenal question. And that's, uh, it brings up a question that's always in debate. It's like, should I manage the property myself or should I hire a property manager? Uh, and I will get to your question after I uh, talk about this a little bit. So I believe that when your first, the first property you house hack, at least the first one, you should manage it yourself. That is for a couple reasons. One, you understand you're on the property, so you know the condition of it, so you can get to it quickly. And then you can understand what it's like to manage a property, um, to do repairs, to do things like find tenants, rent them out, etc. And after you do that for a couple of years, and or you've done it for a couple of properties, then you can hire a property manager. Even ये बंदा कह रहा है, मैंने बोला था ना पिछले बंदे कह रहे थे कि property manager hire करो, तुम खुद property manager नहीं करो, तो ये कह रहा है. Oh. Oh, you, you were breaking up a little bit, so I'll go back to, to answering uh, your question. So you, uh, after you've done that for a, a couple of units you, and you're going to go hire a property manager, then you are more prepared to ask that property manager better questions to understand how good they are at it. Now, you asked, how would you find a tenant for your property? There's a couple ways to go about it. So yes, you could hire a property manager just to fill the vacancy. They're going to charge you somewhere in the, the neighborhood of half the first month's rent to the full amount of that first month's rent. So that's a lot of money. The benefits of them doing that is they don't get paid unless they find you a tenant, and they're hopefully going to do it all legally by the book. If you're in the city of Portland, that makes sense to have a property manager find you a tenant because all the rules and regulations are cloudy and tough to follow. So that's not a bad idea to do at all. If you're gonna do it yourself, which we're gonna do, we just had our tenant move out and we're in the middle of um, turning the unit, painting, doing flooring, redoing the bathroom, et cetera. We're doing it all ourselves. We are gonna advertise it, you know, actually word of mouth, just with friends. We have a lot of, you know, four or five people who are interested in it. Um, other ways you can do it is you can put it on Zillow uh, in, in the rental section. You can put it on Craigslist. There's an app called Cozy.co, C-O-Z-Y dot C-O. That is a way for um, landlords to have their tenants pay them rent, and it's free to the landlords. Um, it's how we use it, and you can set up automatic payments. It'll, uh, if they're late on their rent, it'll charge them an automatic late fee. You can even market your property for rent through that, um, through that app, Cozy, C-O-Z-Y dot C-O. It's wonderful. Hey, hey, Chase, just yeah, to let uh -oh. you know, we've got less than one minute left. And okay. uh, so it was great presentation. If there's any last minute words that you want to give or uh, maybe your contact information again, go for it. Yeah, if anybody has any questions about house hacking, uh, I'm happy to set up a free 15 minute phone call. You can, the best way to get a hold of me is going to be email chase at mrhousehack.com, C H A C E at mrhousehack.com. You can call me um, or send me a text. I'm going to be better at. Um, I'm going to be better at email, but my phone number is 509-393-9123. And if you're not in the Portland market and you want to find a realtor in your area that knows how to work with house hackers, contact me as well, and I'll get you in contact with someone who knows how to work with them because I know how to ask them the right questions. Thank you so much, Chase, for coming and sharing with us, and uh, you're thank obviously you an expert me. in this area. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I can't say uh, how much I appreciate the opportunity. All right, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. All right. Thanks, Chase. Thanks, Thank Daniel. You. Thanks, Daniel.